Hey everyone, uh, most of you already know me, uh, but for those who don't, uh, my name is Dakota Saul. I'm the recruitment officer here for our YAF chapter on campus, uh, and I want to thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, I have a few quick instructions to give everyone. Uh, before Morgan introduces our guest, of course, uh, first of all, the event may run into win tutorials, uh, but we're all going to stay until its conclusion. You don't have to worry about six, you won't miss six. Uh, secondly, there will be an opportunity for Q&A uh, after the speech. Uh, a couple, couple of our officers will be walking around the aisles with mics. So if you have a question, uh, please come to the end of your row um, and an officer uh, will give you a mic. Uh, priority will be given to students uh, for questions, but adults can ask them as well. Um, again. Uh, for adults, if you have a question, go to the end of your row and raise your hand and an officer will find you. Uh, lastly, uh, I know we'll keep it classy and respectful, uh, but just as a reminder, there are teachers, administrators, and Coma County deputies here. Uh, and one more thing, if uh, you guys had pizza tickets, if they gave them to you when you walked in, you can redeem those um, whenever you're walking out and we'll take care of that for you. Um, and then just make sure your cell phones are off. That's just a common courtesy. Um, and then, then again, thank you all for coming, and I'll hand it over to Morgan. Hi, everybody. My name is Morgan Moya, and I am the chairman for the Young Americas for Freedom chapter here on campus. And before I introduce our speaker, uh, there are a few people our chapter would like to thank. Firstly, a huge thank you to the Young Americas Foundation, who has been working with us these past few months and made this event possible. We could not have done it without you. Secondly, we'd like to thank the New Braunfels Republican women and Comal County Republicans who have served as ushers for this event. We would also like to thank Principal Davison for helping make this event possible. Thank you to all the parents who have supported us both as individuals and as a chapter. Lastly, we would like to personally thank Mr. Kroll, who not only has been our teacher sponsor for the past few years and driven our chapter to the Capitol, but who also took time out of his evening last night to stay in the pack while crew members set up for the event. So thank you, Mr. Kroll, for always supporting and inspiring us. <laughs> there you go. Yes, good job. Also, a quick reminder, we will be having our last meeting of the year tomorrow in Mr. Kroll's room during WIN tutorials, so if you are intrigued by what you hear to say here today, please stop by. Okay, and now I will introduce our speaker. Born in Mumbai, India, Dinesh D'Souza came to the U.S. as an exchange student and graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College in 1983. D'Souza has had a 25-year career as a writer, scholar, and public intellectual. A former policy analysis in the Reagan White House, D'Souza also served as a John M. Ullman Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the Robert and Karen Rishwan Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He has also served as the president of the King's College in New York City from 2010 to 2012. Called one of the top young public policymakers in the country by Investors Business Daily, D'Souza quickly became known as a major influence on public policy through his writings. In 2002, D'Souza published his New York Times bestseller, What's So Great About America, which was critically acclaimed for its thoughtful patriotism. Since 2010, D'Souza has written two other New York Times bestselling book, God Forsaken and Obama's America, Unmaking the American Dream, the latter climbing to number one on the New York Times bestseller list and inspiring a documentary on the same topic. The film, called 2016 Obama's America, has risen to the second highest grossing all-time political documentary, passing both Michael Moore's Sicko and Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. These endeavors, not to mention a razor sharp wit and entertaining style, have allowed D'Souza to participate in highly publicized debates and various topics across the country. One of D'Souza's favorite venues for debates and speeches has been college campuses. During the past 20 years, he's appeared at hundreds of colleges and universities and spoken with hundreds of thousands of students. However, today he has come to Canyon High School to speak with us. So please help me in welcoming Mr. Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very happy to be here. And um, actually, oddly enough, a, a little bit nervous to be speaking to you um, because, well, 
you're just so young. And you might think, well, so what? Weren't you 15? Weren't you 17 at one time? Well, when you become my age, you realize that you were at one time 15 or 17, but you've completely forgotten. It's kind of like asking you to remember when you were three. Uh, you don't remember. And so similarly for me to, to connect with you, I was thinking to myself, what is it that I should talk to you about? Um, talk, should I talk to you about America? Well, talking to you about America is a little bit like talking to a fish about the water. You're a fish, you swim in the water, but you don't think about the water. The water is something you take for granted. So America is here, you're part of it. It never occurs to you to think, what makes America different? What makes America unique? The reason I was, at your age, kind of forced to think about these questions is because I was transplanted from one part of the world, Mumbai, actually it was then called Bombay, India, thousands of miles away to the United States. I came at the age of 17 and I never went home. So I literally left behind my family, my friends, um, and I came under in a very different, even America was different uh, then. This was really around 1980. Uh, and I came with $500 in my pocket. Uh, and I didn't know about my own future. In fact, I remember when um, I changed planes in Frankfurt on the way to the United States. Uh, I, I'd, fell, I'd fallen asleep in the flight and so I hadn't eaten. They served a meal, but I didn't get it. And so I walk off the plane and there in front of me was a very, an American sign that I recognized, McDonald's. And I saw this unbelievably juicy picture of a Big Mac and literally my mouth began to water. But then I noticed that the Big Mac combined with fries and a Coke would cost five bucks. And even though I had $500, I realized that's, that may be all the money I would ever have. So I couldn't afford to eat at McDonald's. It was too expensive. So kind of unwillingly I turned around and reboarded the plane. So I just want to give you a feeling for what it's like to come from a different part of the world under different circumstances. And what, what did I come to America for? Well, I came to America for something called the American dream. The American dream. Now, notice that no other country has a dream. Thought about that? I don't mean that people in other countries don't dream. They do have dreams. But they don't have, there's no such thing as the French dream. Or if there is, we don't want to hear about it. <laughs> German dreams are probably downright scary. <laughs> There's certainly no Indian dream. So, so it's worth thinking about what is the meaning of the American dream that, in a sense, you take for granted in America. Um, I thought I would also talk to you a little bit about success because that's something we all want. We want to succeed in life. And yet, how do you succeed? You know, surveys show a lot of young people, even from a very young age, will say things like, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a doctor. But they have absolutely no idea of how you become an astronaut or what it takes to actually be a doctor. And when I was your age, I would, and this was back in India, I would try to think about what is the recipe for success in life. And at that time, I glommed onto the idea, Proverbs. Right? There are all these famous sayings that have come down through time and I thought they're obviously going to distill a lot of wisdom about life. So here's a proverb. Look before you leap. You heard that one? Look before you leap. It means be cautious. And I thought that's probably good advice to be kind of cautious before you take a step. But then there's another proverb. He who hesitates is lost. And it occurred to me, these two proverbs contradict each other. They say the opposite. One says to go for it, the other says to hold back. I'm not really getting a lot of good advice. And then I come to America and I hear a lot of American sayings. Be whatever you want to be. An obvious lie. Right? 
I want to be an NBA professional basketball player. Obviously, I can't. I want to be a woman. Well, now no, you can't. Bad example. Bad example. Bad example. But in general, I think you know that we are, we are dealt a deck of cards in life, right? We're dealt us, this is our quota of looks and intelligence and height and speed and, and strength. And that's gonna set some limits to what we can become. So in other words, a lot of the general things that we're told, we really can't believe. We can't believe. We have to start thinking for ourselves and figuring it out for ourselves. And so I wanna talk about what it means, what does it mean to succeed in America? For example, you might be really smart. Well, how important is it to be smart in America? I, you see all kinds of smart people. They have unbelievably smart things to say. And yet, they are doing what? Teaching romance languages at the community college. Another guy who never went to college is running a pest control business and they're pulling in $1 million a year. So if, that's the, if, if intelligence and smartness were the way to go, how come people who don't seem all that smart are remarkably successful, living the American dream? That's because in, in America, it does take smarts, but it takes a lot of other things that are also really important. So let me step back for a moment and talk about, about America, because while I've been here in America, I've often asked myself this question. Um, how has America changed my life? My life. In other words, what would my life have been like if I never came here, if I stayed in India? Notice, by the way, that lots of people want to come to America. That alone is a very telling fact, right? I was talking to a guy who polices the border between the United States and Mexico, and he goes, I gotta watch for people who are sneaking from Mexico into the United States. I said to him, ever catch somebody sneaking from the United States to Mexico? He goes, that's never happened in all my years. Not one guy. So what does that tell you? What that actually tells you is that in life, people go where the living is better, better. And so it must be that America is offering something that is better than is available elsewhere in the world. Otherwise, people wouldn't be trying to get here. We have this big debate about immigration. And leaving aside the debate and, and what, what our immigration policy should be, the first thing to notice is people want to come to America. They try to break their way in. They, they undertake a lot of risks to get here. There must be something about this club that makes it really cool to be a member. Well, what is that? What is that something that's magnetically drawing people here? What, what makes us the biggest magnet in the world? So I've asked myself this question in my own life. Now, the obvious answer would be, well, Dinesh, you came to America for the same reason as most immigrants. You came for economic opportunity. You came to make your life better, to have a bigger house and a nicer car and more stuff. Now, that is to some degree true. We should not poo-poo the idea of improving your life circumstances. When you, when you go on to college and on to get a job, you'll spend most of your time trying to improve your life circumstances. I have um, an acquaintance in Mumbai, India. He's been trying to come to America for now, it seems like 20 years. He keeps, he can't get a visa, the, per, you know, the permission to come. So finally I said to the guy, I said, why are you so eager to come to America? He goes, Dinesh, I really want to move to a country where the poor people are fat. <laughs> so, to him, to him, America represents material success. A better life, a bigger cheeseburger, a bigger car, more stuff. And more stuff is good, more stuff is good. But, when I look at my own life, see I grew up in a middle class family. My dad was an engineer, my mom a school teacher. So, I'm not part of the Indians that you saw in the movie Slumdog Millionaire. In other words, I didn't grow up like out of grinding necessity. Um, I grew up by American standards poor. I mean, we, our family had a car. But what's interesting is that I would ride in the back seat and my dad would drive. 
I would look down and I would notice that I could see the ground. This was not a good sign. I kind of felt a little bit like Fred Flintstone. So, but what I'm getting at is nevertheless, I grew up in the Indian middle class. And although I didn't have a lot of luxuries, at that time growing up in India, no TV, not just me, no one. Uh, no phone, forget not, not cell phones, no phone in the house. Um, no hot water to come out of a faucet. And I don't just mean to wash your hands, no hot water to bathe. So this was the world I grew up in, but nevertheless, by Indian standards, middle class. And if I look at America, is my life materially better? It is, I have more. But that's actually not the way in which my life has changed the most. My life has changed the most in other ways. How? How? Well, one thing I've noticed in America is that you can do stuff with your life that you can't do in other parts of the world. You can become things that you can't become elsewhere. I have a nephew now in America who wants to be a comedian. Now, in America, that is something that you can tell your parents with a straight face. Dad, I want to become a comedian. Now, I assure you, when I was a kid at 17, if I went to my grandfather and said, Grandpa, I want to be a comedian, he wouldn't even know, even know what to say. I'm not saying he'd be against it. He would literally think he needed to put a thermometer under my tongue and take my temperature. He would think I was nuts. Why? Because that's just not an option available to you. If I had stayed in India, the chances are I would have lived my whole life in a 10 mile radius of where I was born. I would never move. In fact, I grew up in the house that my grandfather built and my father lived in it his whole life. We never moved. If I lived in India, I would have probably become the same thing as my dad. I would have become an engineer or a doctor like one of my uncles. Um, I would have a whole set of opinions that would be predictable in advance. So what am I trying to say to you? What I'm trying to say to you is that my life over there, my destiny would have been given to me. This is your life. We can draw it out in advance. You want to know what you're going to think about this? Pretty much it's what your dad thought. You want to know what you're going to do about that? Pretty much what your grandfather used to do. I'm not saying I would have no choice. I'd have choice. But the choice is within more confined parameters. Part of what we realize about culture is cultures are very different. Sometimes when you go to college, people will deny this. They'll say things like, all cultures are basically the same. That's another big lie. All cultures can't be the same. If all cultures were really the same, no one would ever emigrate from one culture to another. The reason you do that is you think that the other society is better. There's going to be more for you over there. Fundamental things are, are perceived differently in different cultures. Consider love. Love. Now love is a very important American value. You might say, what do you mean by that, Dinesh? Don't people everywhere fall in love? Yes, but not everywhere is love considered to be a valid thing to do. In other words, Let's think about what this means, right? I, Sally, fall in love with John. What does that mean? Well, it actually means that John has qualities that no one else in the entire universe possesses. John is unique. John is special. John is one in six trillion, one in six billion people on the planet. There's only one John. Now, everybody except Sally knows that this is a flat out lie. John is a, just one of the dudes. There's nothing special about him. He's basically having trouble putting on one leg, his pants one leg on at a time. There's just nothing unique about John, but there is to Sally. Right? So if you go to other cultures, you discover that this whole business of falling in love is seen totally differently. For example, when I grew up, my grandmother told me that falling in love is basically a mild form of insanity. <laughs> Why? Because you see in somebody qualities that every other person on the planet knows that they don't have. <laughs> Everyone else can see it. You are temporarily blinded into thinking that this person is unique. 
So what follows from that? What follows from that is that in other cultures, and in this case I'm talking about India, the basic idea is that your parents, your uncles, your community, your society, they should all have a kind of veto power over whom you choose to marry. Not that they're trying to stifle love, they're just trying to guide it. They're just trying to make sure that you end up with some guy who is not only the most unique guy in the planet, but can actually hold a job. In other words, what they're trying to do is look out for your, the interests that seem to be set aside when you fall in love. Now, I'm telling you this not because I want to comment about love, I'm just showing you that different cultures see the world totally differently. And so, the question you want to ask is, what makes our America, you know, unique? What makes it different? Well, here's one thing that makes it different. I'm just looking at the audience here, and I look, at, look around in my own class in Arizona, where I went to high school, or Dartmouth. I see a whole sea of faces, people from different backgrounds, different races, different cultures. So I think to myself, how interesting this is this can happen in America. In other words, here's what I mean. I could pick one of you at random and say, okay, you can come to India, you can live there for 25 years, you can work there, but here's something you can't do. You cannot become Indian. It's not possible. It doesn't matter how long you live there, it doesn't matter if you apply for citizenship, it doesn't matter if you marry an Indian, nobody cares, you can't become an Indian. Why? Because to be Indian you require two things, brown skin and Indian parents. In other words, being an Indian is a matter of blood and birth. That's it. But I notice, in America that's not the case. We have the Irish and the Italians and the Jews and then more recently the Koreans and the West Indians and the Pakistanis and they come to America and they become American. And what does that mean? What that means is that in America, being an American isn't just a function of blood or birth, it's a function of embracing something, an American way of life, an American dream, an American dream. This dream, according to Thomas Jefferson, is called the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness. So the American dream isn't actually happiness, it's the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is a kind of a goal, but most of your life in America is getting there. It's the journey to the goal. And for the American founders, I said I mentioned the American founders, it's worth noting that America is the only country designed on a piece of paper. Think about that. Most countries aren't like that. Nobody in India sat down and said, oh, well, let's, let's decide what it means to be Indian. No one ever thought of that. India just kind of came along through the centuries. But here in America, a bunch of people sat around a table in Philadelphia and they drew up the blueprints of American society. So America is invented. Every other country is just a product of history. This is America's unique in that way. So what I want to ask is, what's unique about the American founding? What's unique about it? Well, according to the American founders, what's unique about America is that this country is based upon emphasizing three, three types of freedom. Three types of freedom. I want to say a word about those because they all affect your life in a very direct way. Here's the first type of freedom. Economic freedom. Economic freedom. What does economic freedom mean? Economic freedom basically means something very simple. If you earn it, you can keep it. Abraham Lincoln put it pretty well when he said, the hand that makes the corn should be the hand that eats the corn. The guy that makes the corn gets to eat the corn. In other words, it's your stuff and you get to keep it. Now we all realize we have to pay taxes in a society, we have to do, give government its due, but by and large the presumption is that if you grew it, if you made it, if you thought of it, if you wrote it, if you invented it, it's yours. It's yours. That's the first freedom. Very important one, economic freedom. Here's the second freedom, 
freedom of speech and religion, which is basically the freedom to speak your mind. To speak your mind. Very important freedom. Because it basically means in, in a society, you can't have a democracy, you can't have a debate, you can't even have a discussion if people can't speak their minds. Now what does speaking your mind mean? Speaking your mind means being able to listen to someone who doesn't agree with you, digest what they have to say, and then respond. Freedom of speech does not mean, hey, here's a poster for a speaker on campus. I don't like what this guy stands for. I'm going to pull the poster down. That's called little Nazi behavior. <laughs> little Nazi behavior is not good. Why? Because we don't really want little Hitler youth in this country pulling down other people's posters. It may seem like a small thing, but it's actually a very big thing. Just like if you walk into a church and you take the host and you step on it, it's not a small thing. It may seem like a small thing. After all, it's only a wafer, but it's not a wafer. So think before you do this kind of stuff. Why? Because freedom of speech is one of our core principles. So economic freedom, freedom of speech. Here's the third one, political freedom. Political freedom means we have, we live in a democratic society. We all have a say in our government. And we all get to vote every two years, every four years, decide who our president, who our leader should be. Notice that even though we had an election in November, there's a huge brouhaha in this country if you follow the news, which is still basically arguing about the election. It's still basically on the assumption that the election is somehow invalid. I mean, have you ever heard calls for Trump needs to step down? Well, he just, he literally just took the oath of office. Why does he need to step down? Well, it's something to do with this guy, Comey. He wrote a memo. Where's the memo? No one's seen the memo. But a reporter for the New York Times talked to a guy who talked to another guy who claims that there is a memo. Here's what I'm getting at. It's very strange what's happening in America today because even though we had an election, and normally after an election, there might be a lot of yelling and screaming before the election, but after the election, people settle down. And they basically say, all right, I may not like the guy. In fact, I was no fan of Obama. And to be honest with you, Obama was no fan of me. <laughs> now, people might say, oh, Dinesh, don't, don't, you know, don't say stuff like that. He's the president of the United States. What makes you think he gives five minutes to think about you, etc." But I did make a movie about Obama. And, I, and I, did, I, did, I did something that was kind of naughty from his point of view, which is I went to Kenya. I showed up at his family homestead. I met his grandmother. I found his brother. His brother was living in a small hut in Nairobi. So I thought this was kind of interesting. Here's Obama, he's like, we are our brother's keeper. Well, here's Obama's actual brother and he's living, he's the guy living in Slumdog Millionaire. Obama's apparently done nothing for him. So I put all this in my movie. And um, then attacks on me by name began to appear on a website called BarackObama.com. So that's why I got the idea that maybe the big man in the White House was not too happy with the movie. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is there's an election. You may not like Obama, but nevertheless, you didn't find me at his inauguration bashing the local Starbucks or setting cars on fire or trying to block people from going to the ceremony or demanding a recount even though he obviously won or trying to say things like, well, it's true that Obama won, but under the Norwegian rules of politics, he would have lost, which is kind of what you hear about Trump. Well, it's true that Trump won, but had we been deciding elections according to the popular vote. See, remember, in all these things, we agree on the rules in advance. It's kind of like in tennis. We say, okay, it's gonna be five sets. First guy to win three sets wins the match. Now, it's quite possible that someone can win more overall points and still lose. Here's a tennis result. Federer versus Nadal. 6-4, 6-4, 0-6, 1-6, 6-4. Federer wins, but actually if you add up those scores, you'll see Nadal won, he got more points. But who cares? We're not counting points, we're counting sets. Essentially, democracy is about fair play. It's about having a set of rules and playing by the rules. 
That's part of what it means to be in America. One of the things I learned in America, I'd never heard it before. What goes around comes around. What does it mean? It means that we in this country believe in cosmic justice. Someone can get away with it, but they're not gonna get away with it forever. At some point, it's gonna catch up with them. Fair rules, fair rules. Now, uh, when I first came to America, I was invited, I went to Washington DC after college. I was invited to a reception by Congressman, then, then Congressman Schumer, now a senator. And he gave me the whole spiel about liberalism and the Democratic Party. I want to talk a little bit about the difference between the liberal and the conservative, the difference between the Republican and the Democrat. I'm going to give you my point of view, but think about it. It's worth thinking about these things. And really, if you think about the real benefit of being in high school, it's the benefit of having that curiosity that you had as a kid not drummed out of you not drummed out of you. It gets a little drummed out of you over time. If you, if you look at most college students, most of their curiosity is drummed out of them. They have that kind of bored expression. And, and what is boredom? Boredom is essentially the active task of killing off your own brain cells. That's what boredom is. It's essentially shutting down curiosity. When you're a kid, you're super curious, right? God, why are you twice as tall as me? Why is the sky blue? Why, how, how do we know that the earth is round? It looks flat. How do we know it's round? And, and in, in ancient times, people would have to think about these exact questions. Before they could, could fly in a satellite and take a picture of the Earth, they had to ask, how do we know the Earth is round? By the way, here's one way. An eclipse. In an eclipse, here's the sun, here's the Earth, and here's the moon. And we can see the shadow of the Earth on the moon. Gentlemen, it's round. By the way, that's how the ancients knew that the earth was round. They could see the, the shadow of the entire earth on the moon. So this is curiosity, but as you get older, and in fact, even in high school, you learn, you know, a speaker's coming to go, oh, campus, I'm gonna shut my brain down. You lose that curiosity. Now, one reason I wanna say a word about conservatism in America is because today a lot of young people don't know what it is. Conservatism. Because think about it, conservatism is about conserving. So you might ask the question, what is it that conservatives want to conserve? What are they trying to conserve? And why is, why is there a big fight about it? What's so controversial about what conservatives believe? Well, the truth of it is, what conservatives want to conserve are the principles of the American Revolution. That's what we're trying to conserve. Now, people say, well, the American Revolution was 200 years ago. Are you trying to bring that stuff back right now? No. We're not trying to do that. You have to distinguish the principles of the, of the founding from the world that we live in now. We're trying to figure out how do you apply eternal principles to changing situations. So what does it mean to have those principles of the founding in the 21st century? And why is this controversial? Because things that conservatives consider obvious have now become a business for a fight, for a fight. Take the simple principle that you get to keep the stuff that you make. You get to keep the stuff that you earn. It seems obvious. Who would possibly be against that? If somebody were to come to you and say, oh, you know what? It was Halloween and you got this big bag of Halloween candy, but look around, notice that some of the other people have smaller bags. So we're gonna be reaching into your bag to take a bunch of your Halloween candy to spread the candy around. You'd be like, are you insane? That's my stuff. Or if someone were to come to you and say, oh, you know what, you just got an A minus on your test, but you notice that some other kids got C's and D's and perhaps their circumstances are a little more disadvantaged than yours. They didn't have the opportunity to study quite as hard. Um, they didn't have the same parental upbringing. So how about we redistribute some of your GPA and give some of your grade points to them? You'd be like, are you nuts? I worked hard for those grades. Those are my grades. Well, the same principle applies when you're out in the workforce and you get your paycheck and you think, wrongly as it turns out, that it's yours. <laughs> because there's a whole other group in this country, we call them Democrats, trying not to make that a swear word, 
And their argument is that the stuff that you earn is the common property of society that if Congress wants to, it should be able to take and give to somebody else. Now, let's be careful here because the American founders did talk about the government promoting the common welfare. The common welfare. But think about this for a moment. The common welfare is the welfare of everybody. Here we are in Canyon High School. What's the common welfare? Well, the common welfare, for example, is let's keep Canyon High School safe. Let's make sure that we have some cops who don't let outsiders on campus where they can take advantage or prey on or steal from students. That, that benefits everybody to do that. That's the common welfare. And, and that's why we have cops in America and we have a defense department because it's to protect the security of all of us. But now the government comes along and says, oh Dinesh, let me reach into your back pocket, lift out your wallet, help myself to it, and then turn it over to some other guy. I say to myself, where's the common welfare? As I see it, you're picking the pocket of, Je of, of Peter to pay Paul. Now I can fully understand that any government that systematically robs Peter to pay Paul can totally count on Paul's support. And here we have an explanation for the democratic voter, right? Any transaction that's moving money from there over to me, I'm in favor of. But it seems to violate the simple principle, the Lincolnian principle, remember Lincoln's the founder of the Republican Party, that the guy who makes the corn should be the guy who eats the corn. And our government does all kinds of stuff that in the private society you would never condone. Let's say your neighbor came to you and said, hey Bill, um, you know, I'm, um, I'm pregnant. I didn't mean to do it, but I am. And I want you to give me $400 a month so I can support this unplanned pregnancy that I'm going to have. Now, first of all, I would submit that very few people would go, absolutely. At the very least, you'd say, well, listen, you know, okay, I'll try to help, but you know, there, you gotta be more careful. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. You gotta, and, and, and finally, if you can ever pay me back, I expect you to do that. And, and if a year later, the same person shows up and goes, shoot, I don't know how to tell you this, but pregnant again. I'd like to have another 300 a month to you know, tide me over. I think you would say, absolutely not. But the government doesn't do that. For the government, it's simply a matter of statistics. Do you qualify? Yes, you do. Here are your benefits. You qualify again, here are your benefits again. In other words, the government does unconscionable things that if you and I were made to do them, would be outrageous. I'll give you a final example. I know I'm running out of time. I, wanna, I need to leave time for questions. So let me just say this. In private life, if you go up to some guy and say, listen, I'm gonna put a gun to your head. Give me all your money by force. And then you take the money and you say, I'm going to go now and find a very needy person and give all this money to them. Right? What would you call a person who did that? I would call them a dangerous criminal who needs to be locked up. And yet, if the US government does it, it's okay. It's okay. And that's what the US government does do, does do. All right, let me sum up. My goal in talking to you today is not to convince you to think this way, or vote for that guy, or to be a Trumpster, or to be an anti-Trumpster. It's to convince you that you live in a unique kind of society, America, that this society will allow you to fulfill your life in a unique way. If you lived elsewhere, you wouldn't have these same opportunities. So feel grateful about the kind of water that you swim in as a fish. It happens to be very good water, as it turns out. Lots of other fishes are trying to make their way over here. And finally, don't lose that innate curiosity that you had as a child that is actually the driving force of what will make your life interesting as an adult. Lots of adults live really boring lives. And a big reason for that is that they have allowed boredom to snuff out 
that childlike sense of wonder, which is the heart of learning. Ultimately, be open to different points of view. If you're a liberal, listen to the conservative. If you're a conservative, listen to the liberal. And ultimately, look at America as a stage for growth. You may not be able to become everything that you want to be, but you can certainly become a lot better than you are. You can become a better version of yourself. And that ultimately is the American dream. Ultimately, even though happiness is the goal, if you pursue it in the American way, you'll find a lot of happiness along the way also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We uh, have a few minutes for questions, and I believe we've got some mics in the audience, so I'm um, ready when you have the mics. Yeah, my name's Carter. We're going to be doing some uh, Q&A, so if you want to ask a question, just uh, raise your hand and I'll bring it over to you. Hi, so my name is Maya Baim, and I'm a senior here. Um, so you brought up some of the points about the American principles and how the conservatives want to preserve that idea. Um, what is so different between America letting immigrants into our country, one of the reasons why you are here, and helping our own people in our country? People are here because they need help and more opportunities, and that's why you are here, as you called for, for more economic opportunities. Um, so who are we as Americans to say that we will let other people into our country to help them but not help ourselves? Uh, good question. Um, and the way to think about it is like this. If you have a club, you have a set of rules for who gets to be in the club. And you, the members of the club, the Americans who are here now, citizens, get to decide whether to have immigrants how many to have, and what are the rules that they have to follow. In many other countries, they are very explicit about this. The Canadians will say, we need nurses. We're going to let in 10,000 nurses. The Australians will say, we need radiologists. We need agricultural workers. And we're going to let the people in who are going to benefit the people who live here now. They're very conscious about that. Now, immigrants, I think, have done a lot for this country. They've built this country. They've played a big role in this country. But it's very important to keep in mind a distinction between the legal and the illegal immigrant. Why? Because the club has set rules and there's a long line. It's not easy to become a citizen. It, I came in 1978 as, for the 12th grade. I became a citizen in 1991. So it took me well over a decade and an immigration lawyer and many applications and all kinds of stuff. So it, it's not easy to, and you don't want people who jump the line. Um, and so a lot of times in our immigration debate today, we forget about the distinction between the illegal immigrant and even the term illegal immigrant is wrong because there's no such thing. If you're, if you're an immigrant, you're legal. If you're an illegal, you're not an immigrant. You've obviously not played by the rules. Swimming across the Rio Grande is not considered playing by the rules. So by and large, that's the focus of our debate. America has every right to choose the people it wants. It should give priority to American citizens. The country exists for its own citizens. It's a social contract among citizens. So I agree with your priorities. Now the country has decided to take a certain number of legal immigrants every year. I'm in favor of that, but I'm also in favor of enforcing our immigration laws. My wife, Debbie, who's here in the audience, Debbie's an immigrant from Venezuela. I'm an immigrant from India. So we obviously both are immigrants. We like immigrants, we like immigration but we don't like illegal immigration. And this is where the media is being very sly. I mean, I read the New York Times. Immigrants living in terror in Trump's America. I'm like, I'm not living in terror. Why not? Because no one's trying to deport me. Why not? Because I'm a US citizen. Because I came by the rules. So it's important, but we're a nation of laws. Let's enforce them. Um, but even then for like, not the not talking about the illegal immigrants, but the people that are legally allowed to come over here, 
why are we focused on letting them in and helping them? I'm all for immigration, but you brought up the point of what's mine is mine and I shouldn't have to share it with other people. Why are we opening spaces to other people to come in and have economic success whenever we're not even willing to help out the people that have been born in America and have legally been citizens since the beginning of their generations? Yeah, because we'll remember that they too came, if they didn't come as immigrants themselves, many times they're descended from immigrants. So the immigrant pattern goes way back. Now, in the old America, where there was an infinity of land, you could come in the 1850s and there was no question. You could just go out, go out as a homesteader and there was land available for you. We don't have that now, right? So we've got, I think we should have an immigration policy that asks, how, how do these immigrants help us? Now, if an immigrant is coming as an entrepreneur, they're gonna start businesses, invest money, create jobs. That's good for natives. That's good for people here now, right? Uh, if, if, someone is, if someone comes as an agricultural worker in California, that's a tougher one because there are people who are, gonna, who are willing to do agricultural work, but the immigrants will do it for less. That's a tougher question. And in the past, we used to have a guest worker program called the Bracero program, where Mexicans could come to America, work in the agricultural fields, no US citizenship, work, get paid, pay taxes, go home. So there are all kinds of in-between policies to consider. And um, it looks to me that our country is overdue for an immigration debate to sort out these very issues. All right, thank you. Okay, all right. Other questions? Any other questions? Hi, I'm Tyler, and I had a quick question. Do you, you looked at Obama's presidency and Trump's. Do you sometimes feel that over the past few years or ever since you've been in America, do you feel like sometimes America gets involved in other countries' situations and issues that they're having? And how do you feel like we should handle them, where we should be involved or not? Very good question. This is about how involved should America be in sorting out the problems of other countries? Um, and the answer is that, unlike the Europeans, who have actually had a very long involvement in and familiarity, familiarity with, the British, for example, came to India, I believe, in the 17th century. So they, have, they had been in India for 200 years, and they've left a very strong imprint. In fact, the reason I'm speaking to you in English right now when I first came to America, you know, I'd go around, people would go, you speak unbelievable English. And I'd go, well, I've already been in the country for four weeks. They'd be like, what? But obviously I learned as a kid, uh, but they didn't know that. They just thought it was unbelievable that I spoke really good English um, in America. But the reason I speak English at all is because of British influence in India. Now, coming to your question, America, because we're such a big continent and we're a little isolated from Europe and from Asia, by and large, our knowledge of these other cultures is quite low. And so we always have to be very careful in getting involved in other countries because we don't actually know what's going on in the ground. You know, it's a, it's a commonsensical principle. If you, let's say you show up in a, in a mall, you see an SUV, the door is open, there's a three-year-old kid in a car seat, and there's no mom to be found. What do you do? You say, there is a negligent mother who has left her kid. I'm calling 911. I'm calling Child Protective Services. What do you do? Because you could be wrong. It could be that her other kid is having trouble and she just ran in to help him. He's in Starbucks and she has to grab him. And, and so the kid is not being neglected. You just don't know what's going on yourself. And so what do you do? You should be a little cautious. You should try to learn more. So the bottom line of America is we have lots of problems at home. I think Trump's idea that we should focus on American problems is good. Now, there are bad guys in the world who want to kill us. And that is the sad fact of the matter. And so recognizing that and not just saying, okay, well, you know what? We'll wait around here when they show up to kill us. We'll then kind of do some things. It's good for us to have a foreign policy that is aware of dangers to American security. That's one of the main jobs of a government. 
Then one of the main jobs of the government, in fact, the main one, is to protect us from foreign and domestic thugs. The government, that's the first thing any government should do. And in fact, it should do nothing else if it can't do that. Everything else it does is secondary. So protecting us from foreign threats, that's a very legitimate job of the government. But in terms of trying to fix other countries' problems, uh, I think we've got enough here to worry about right now. Okay, let's take maybe one more question. All right. And I would like to then wrap it up, or actually there are two. I'll finish with both of you and then I'll close out, okay? All right, where's the mic? Uh, oh, the, oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Hello there, sir, how you doing? I guess pretty good. Um, good. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was one of those, you know, questions that didn't need an answer. No, no, no that wasn't my question, don't worry. <laughs> I'm just being cordial, I guess. I, I wrote down my question so I wouldn't forget. Uh, I and many others are con continuing our education online with Ben Shapiro, Andrew Clavin, Stephen Crowder, Prager University, etc., many others. And um, in, honest, in all honesty, I came upon uh, those great political thinkers because of Milo Yiannopoulos. I saw him and the bombs that he was lobbing, and then I was like, well, I like what the people he's making angry, but it's, uh, I, I can't you know, ride gung-ho with him. And then I came across the others, and I was like, these are the people I like to listen to. But in the pursuit of political knowledge, am I selling myself short? Should I be... Uh, looking at some other places, or are those uh, political thinkers enough uh, to, you know, counteract the narrative that we hear and then also um, help with other generations? Well, in the political arena, that's a pretty good start. Those are, those are smart guys. I would add Charles Krauthammer. There are other names I could, I could add to the list. But also remember that, in, in, that the greatest thought in any society is in general going to come from dead people. This may seem weird to say, but in general, the past has existed much longer than the present. The people who are walking around now are a tiny minority of the people who have, who have lived. And through the past, wisdom has been distilled through the centuries, right? So you take somebody like John Locke. John Locke was actually one of the smartest men of the 18th century, worldwide. Right? Andrew Clavin may, may be one of the smartest guys in Beverly Hills, California. But I wouldn't say he's one of the smartest guys in the 21st century. So what I'm getting at is by, by reading the classics, the great thinkers of the past, you become wiser than experience can ordinarily make you. You always think, well, experience is the best teacher. No, experience is very limited. It just happens to be all the bumbling fools that you run into every day. Your experience is limited to them. But if you go to books and ideas, you get experience in other times and other places. So you can think of the past as a form of travel. You're traveling through time in the same way that you'd learn a lot if you jumped on a plane and went to Cambodia. You'd learn a lot from a different place. Well, we can learn a lot from a different time and place. So don't give up on the great books, okay? Yes, someone down here. Uh, yeah, let's ask this young lady right here. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm, name, I'm Savannah, and I was wondering, do you agree with like welfare and food stamps and stuff like that? The question is, do I agree? Like that America should have that. Yeah, do I agree with welfare and food stamps and other such stuff? Now, that's a little bit of a complicated question because, because let, let, me, let me look at it this way. The number of people who are on food stamps in the United States I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the number escalated dramatically in Obama's America. In other words, let's just say, for example, and I'm making up these numbers, that there were 30 million people on food stamps, or 40 million people on food stamps. Suddenly, in eight years, 70 million people are getting food stamps. Yep. This is because Democrats like to expand the reach of food stamps. Now, the important thing to realize is for Democrats, it's considered free stuff. Because you get a card, you can go to the grocery store, and you can get stuff without paying for it or by paying with the food stamps, with the EBT card. The question I would have is this. Did the number of hungry people in America increase from 40 million to 70 million in eight years? Was the Obama economy so terrible? Did he do such a horrible job? 
that essentially he flung 30 million people into poverty who now need to be fed at someone else's ex and remember nothing Milton Friedman the economist once said there's no such thing as a free lunch by which he meant that nothing's free people say well education's free Education's not free. It costs money to have this building. It costs money to use this technology. It costs money to have books. Somebody is paying for it. Somebody is paying for it. So is it fair? It looks to me, am I in favor of food stamps? Yes. Am I in favor of unemployment benefits? Yes. But I would, I would confine those things to what FDR himself called the truly needy. Or one scholar, William Julius Wilson, calls it the truly disadvantaged. We have to be careful to make sure that the guy that we're given the free stuff to, A, really deserves it, and B, is also going to work to get himself or herself off the free stuff. We need to set up ways because whenever you, you, you do things that are supposedly good for free, you create bad incentives. Let me give you one example. Uh, this relates to Obamacare. Isn't healthcare right? Because after all, people get sick, shouldn't, they, shouldn't we be able to give them healthcare? Well, let me ask you this. Isn't food a right? Shouldn't people have a right to food? Now, let's imagine that the US government were to say to you, OK, you have a right to food. So when you go to Kroger, you just fill up your cart with what you think you need for the week's groceries. But when you show up at the counter, you don't have to pay. You just take the stuff and go. What would happen? What would actually happen in this country if you did that? Well, you'd say, first of all, normally I buy two cartons of milk, but..." It's free. I'll buy 10. So you fill up your cart. Your cart is huge. You show up at the counter. Now, the person at the counter doesn't really care, but somebody owns that store. The guy who owns Kroger, John Kroger. I'm just guessing it's him. He goes, hey, I notice people are taking all this stuff. But an even more important realization, none of them are really paying. This is great because since some other guy is paying, I will now start charging $40 for a carton of milk. Why? Because the guy's not going to care. It's free to him. He's not paying. So suddenly milk now costs $40. And who's paying? The taxpayer. The third guy who's not at Kroger, who gets no milk. That's the guy footing the bill. And who's ripping him off? Two people are ripping him off. Kroger and the customer. Because the customer is taking more milk than he or she needs. And Kroger's making a profit that's undeserved because some third guy is being cheated. So what I'm getting at is that politics can be a form of cheating. Politics can be a form of two guys getting together to rip off some third guy. And part of being smart is figuring that out. Not just being an idiot and going, oh, I like free stuff. Realizing nothing's free. Someone's paying. Who's paying? Is it fair that they should pay? This is part of our democratic debate. And I'm not trying to resolve it again. I'm just trying to teach you how to think about it and to look behind the curtain, like in The Wizard of Oz. Let's look behind the curtain to see what's really going on. OK, I think we're out of time, guys. I want to say thank you for this invitation. Thank you for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.